Megan and I take things in a little bit different direction as we leave the MCU Star Trek Star Wars world, and we're going to take a deep dive into the 2002 science fiction series Firefly. First up, the pilot episode Serenity. So Megan, we're going to go in a very different direction today with starting a review of Firefly. So episode one, the pilot Serenity. Where should we begin? At the beginning? <laughs> Let's, I think, at, begin at the beginning and maybe even with a little context about this series. So if you're a listener of this show, that we're into Marvel, we're into Star Trek. And after much wheedling on my part, Tom has agreed to watch Firefly, which I believe is a first time for you it going is. through the series. So this is by Joss Whedon, who, of course, we remember from The Avengers and from other things he's created. And while there are some problems with him, he makes cool TV. The first episode we're going over today, Serenity, is the current pilot, the first episode that's available on the streaming platforms. It was not the first episode that ever aired, because Fox, the network that it was airing on, had some feelings about it. They actually aired Train Job, the next episode we'll be talking about first. But this really is where you get to meet the universe, get to meet the characters, get to meet the big bads in their various iterations. And I've been a fan of Firefly since I first saw it many years ago. And Tom... Coming to this for the first time, just top of your head, what did you think? So I either made the mistake or was prescient not to read anything about this series <laughs> before I watched the first one. And and then I have read some commentary since then in preparation for this podcast. And actually, I think I got it right. I went, oh, this is a Western. And so the original Star Trek was envisioned by Gene Roddenberry Roddenberry as the wagon train to the sky, to the stars. This was not a wagon train, but it was clearly a Western, and it clearly mm -hmm. is a Western. And so what I tried to focus on, certainly in the pilot, was who were these characters in mm -hmm. every Western I've ever seen. Ooh. Now, being a boy, of course, a hooker with a heart of gold. So that stood out immediately, <laughs> whether it's Holly Golightly from Moon River or, you know, any hooker with a heart of gold from any Western, that was the one. The uh, Being a Southerner, the uh, disaffected captain mm -hmm. was on the losing side. That was a trope, certainly in the 40s and 50s in John Wayne, the John Wayne, John Ford trilogy. That's something we've seen before. The, uh, the dynamic between his lieutenant and his pilot oh. is interesting because I love it. I love it his heart. lieutenant <laughs> is female and they have an incredibly close relationship that has, at least so far, nothing I've seen has led me to believe it was ever physical. Yet the pilot, I think, being a male, uh, being a male, I should just say, is a little worried that the captain is a little too close to his wife, who he clearly adores. <laughs> Not just loves, but adores. So there's that interesting dynamic. We have the lawman on this flight. He is, in many ways, a bad guy. And then we have the stowaways. They're not <laughs> stowaways in this, but they play the stowaway roles of River Tam, who is the stowaway girl running away, and I think... Simon is her brother, Simon Tam, who's the genius doctor. And so they're clearly running away from something, and we get more about that as the episode unfolds. And since it's science fiction, of course, it's horrible experiments, <laughs> some medical experiments. So I was really trying to place all these people in the pantheon of great Westerns that I have seen and those characters. So that's how I started off with all. Well, awesome. do you think there are like similar characters in, in sort of the Western pantheon for Jane the Mercenary, for the itinerant preacher, and what about the delightfully charming mechanic? Yes, and the mechanic <laughs> who is completely untrained, but is in sync with every piece of machine ever <laughs> created, and just can basically feel it. Yes, the preacher, another <laughs> trope. So the fallen preacher, it's not exactly a Western, but Richard Burton plays a great fallen preacher here and there. Yes. So an interesting gr group of characters. Because it's a Western, we're going to go to places that are exciting. <laughs> we're on the frontier. 
And in many ways, that reminded me of Deep Space Nine, because unlike other Star Treks, where even though they were traveling in spaceships, they weren't on the frontier. So with Deep Space Nine, for instance, we had a lot more moral ambiguity, and I suspect we'll see some of that here. But So I was just trying to, because I hadn't read anything about it, trying to figure out who all of these characters were, where they were going to sit, and how they were going to develop. So that's how I spent the pilot. How was your re-watching of it? Oh, gosh. It felt like revisiting with old friends. This was, I think I first watched this, I was in my early 20s when I first encountered Firefly. And I was absolutely hooked from the very beginning. I love the world that they create, or the version of the universe that they created. I've always been a fan of Alan Tudyk, Nathan Fillion. They're longtime Longtime favorites of mine. And I really liked a lot of what you mentioned, the relationship between Wash the pilot and Zoe, the lieutenant. It's one of my favorite relationships on TV, just of any, in any franchise, on any series. They're one of my favorite couples. And of course, Zoe being hard, super competent fighting woman, that's like the Josh Wheaton hallmark. That's, I don't think he's done anything that doesn't have that particular character, but absolutely loved it. And the, one of my favorite relationships that I think has the best chemistry between that captain and the hooker with the heart of gold inara yeah they have they have the most amazing chemistry and oh point of record i won't bring this up every single episode the language mal uses to talk about her is shameful and did not age well and should not be approved of in any way but now that's out there i don't have to say it every single time he says it. i was interested in your right to think about that in the context of 2023 because when he said that to her i was immediately offended and i thought somebody's going to get slapped or shot. And then and she doesn't. She's, oh, no, I'm, I'm more of a companion. And, and I think, yeah. Let me finish. Let me Please, follow sorry, through. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> then I thought back when this was written, the, and the word is hooker, the word had less, I don't want to say less of a negative connotation, but less of an offensive connotation. So I think you're absolutely right to point that out. And even my own personal experience was I was horribly offended watching that this week. Whereas if when I'd seen it when it first came out, I went, not that I would ever call anyone that, but yeah, that word was, was, was not as offensive as it is now. So I thought that was a really interesting dynamic, and I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, and it was an interesting choice even for when it was made in the mid-2000s, I think it was, especially because this whole universe has been constructed with sex work as not just a legal profession, but one that is held in quite high regard. And then you've got our main character, who we're supposed to like the most, being a complete jerk about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was an interesting choice, and uh, yeah, not the best one. But uh, both great characters. We'll forgive them for that. Oh, and we left one character out, the heavy. <laughs> Jane! <And> Jane. <laughs> Jane. So Jane is also a trope. We often get the big, not too smart... It's got a lot of common sense character. He doesn't say much, talks with his fist or his gun or his knife, but often it's the threat of his fist or his gun or his knife that gets as much done. And mm. I was a little disconcerted in this episode because I thought it played too much to him not being too smart. And, and I know that, well, I assume that won't happen down the road because you can't have a character of any interest that's that stupid. And so I'm assuming there's going to be some light in all of this. But he is this, and then with the name Jane, I thought that was particularly interesting. Growing up with the song A Boy Named Sue. <laughs> I wonder you know, if that was inspired, or that inspired it. <laughs> right. But also, so we've got Muscle on, on board. We were good, uh, good to point him out as well. Yeah, and I think Jane's really interesting because, as you say, he definitely doesn't come across as, uh, to use some of the verbiage, overburdened with smarts or schooling <laughs> he does he always has always struck me as someone who definitely can see the value in being underestimated and that's that's the way i think about him he can definitely i think it's calculated more than anything to an extent typically that role is the strong silent type mm -hmm. and think clint eastwood <laughs> but he's not silent and probably that's what put me off a little bit <laughs> that what's the phrase don't say something when saying something will remove all doubt as to your intellect. <laughs> Better something to be silent like and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. We get the characters set up. We get the setup. They're running. We have the opening scene of the battle, the last battle between the Alliance and the Rebels. So we have some backstory as to what happened to them. Yeah, and I thought that was a really interesting opening. And I'd love to get your thoughts on it because you see the opening scene, the very beginning of this Western, supposed to be set in space, supposed to be space age about the future. But that war looked like it could have been happening absolutely any time from 1940 to now. There was very little, except for maybe slightly fancier weapons, until they realize they've lost. There's almost no indication uh, that it isn't traditional warfare. Absolutely, absolutely right. What I didn't understand in this first pilot that I, I did fully appreciate when I did reading for this podcast was the nature of the, of the political nature of the conflict and what the alliance meant of uh, the winners versus the losers and that the alliance is essentially an amalgamation of the United States and Communist China or the West and Communist China perhaps mm-hmm. more broadly. I thought that was interesting as well. Yeah, it made me think of, especially when they were hoping for that air support and they didn't get it really out of the kind of like the incompetence of management that the British displayed during World War One. <laughs> And the absolute abandoning of their own people. <laughs> on Dieppe. I'm sure yep. that's burned into the Canadian memory. <laughs> right, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the universe that this is all happening in, because we've just come from Star Trek, which is very different. And this is a completely alternate imagining to how things could go. With the, You've got the Alliance as the main central power. You've got all these border worlds, basically the poor of the galaxy. We seem to have a world with no extraterrestrials, no non-human life forms. And another big bad, the Reavers, which I'm very excited to hear your thoughts on. I thought the Reavers were that other life form, although they're Mm -hmm. apparently human. So I thought they were going to play that role. What intrigued me, though, was the terraforming of planet. And that's hinted at Star Trek in the movies, two and three, not hinted at it, it happens. It's not really viewed as a positive in Star Trek. But here... They find basically a rock and terraform it. And what we learn is each terraforming is different. One, because of the place being terraformed, but two, also the way the terraforming process, whatever that might be, organic or mechanical, interacts with the atmosphere and the planet itself. So it's going to lead to some really interesting variations. But I just love the idea of terraforming to form planets that people can live at with the noted caveat that if they're native indigenous people out there, we have to remember (laughs) we're both from countries that did very bad things to Mm -hmm. the native peoples. And I hope we don't find there's a series of indigenous peoples that have been wiped out by this terraforming, but that's not apparent to me at this point, if that's true. Yeah, and I think I, I think we're 20 years past. It, it's not a plot point. So as, to the best of my knowledge, this is a human-only solar system. So that's a, a, an interesting way to, to look at expansion into the galaxy. And I like the whole premise that they're like, they used up our solar system, our Earth, completely gone. All that is left is the new alliance and the outer worlds. So in many ways, I compared this series to the book and movie or the book and television series, The Expanse which I really enjoyed. And also, you had people looking for new opportunities. And in Mm -hmm. the expanse, it was colonies created in Mars and then people living on planetoids and asteroids between Earth and Mars and then moving beyond Mars and the trials and tribulations of some of that uh, with an extraterrestrial component overlaid Mm -hmm. on top. And here we don't have the ETs yet, if they're coming, but people moving and whether it's moving out because the earth is too polluted, whether it's moving out for economic opportunity, I just love the thought of moving west. And yeah. both of our countries, everybody in America, we said, go west, young man, uh, because that was where opportunity was or yeah, perceived my, to be. My family's from the East Coast, and a lot of younger people, you have to go west, work, go to Alberta, work in the oil sands. There's, uh, there's no money out east. So. Yeah, I just... That's something that still appeals to me, the migration or immigration. My grandfather came from Italy, although he was a very young boy, so he didn't make the decision, but his parents did. That part of a migrant ancestry is ingrained in me, and I still am excited to see people can still do that, even if it's hardship and 
a lot of hard work and some privations. So I think that's And on a moon. And on a moon. (laughs) So let's talk about the Reavers. So they're this kind of mysterious, malignant force in the universe. What did you think of the way they were introduced and the way people, our crew that we are getting to know, reacted to them? And maybe compared to the Borg, because we've talked about the Borg a lot from our last last season. Actually, though, I didn't think of the Borg. I Mm -hmm. thought of Alfred Hitchcock. Ooh. Because he says the most powerful terror is the one you don't show. And that's what I thought of with the Reavers. Because in this episode, their ship passes by uh, the Serenity. And you correctly pointed out the reaction of the crew of the Serenity clearly implies there's some bad dudes on that ship. (laughs) And let's hope they don't notice us. And so I really love the way they introduced it with the terror was the reaction of the crew of the Serenity, not the terror of seeing the Reavers. And that it certainly makes me more curious and perhaps it makes it more terrifying not to see them. They, but your comparison of the Borg is well put for one key reason. The Borg would not assimilate if it was not in their interest or like we've seen multiple times <clears throat> crew members of the enterprise or other ships go onto a Borg ship and the Borg don't pay any attention to because mm-hmm. they're no threat. So maybe there's something of that going on, but what did, what do you see at this point from the Reavers? I thought the other one, because one of the things they mentioned when they're talking about the Reavers is that, and this is why I thought the Borg comparison, it came through really strongly to me was that they were at one point men and they were humans who had turned in some way, something had happened to them much like what happens when you get assimilated and they become something horrifying, something other. So I thought that was an interesting comparison. And just, I think it was particularly Inara's reaction when they knew the Reavers are coming and she had this little suicide kit. This is going to be a better way to go. I thought was just chilling. Anyway, they're a fantastic evil force in the universe. (laughs) Even their lack of self-preservation, which is a big difference from the Borg, they're in a radioactive ship, right? Like they're not even trying to preserve themselves. They're so far gone from what we'd call humanity. I thought, oof, great bad guys. I think they're going to be a great bad guy. But maybe they're not even a bad guy. Maybe they're just misunderstood. <laughs> maybe they're misunderstood. And <laughs> last one, what about, we didn't get to see too much of the Alliance, but we got to see a little bit about them. Did they remind you of any other kind of space age governmental agencies, any other franchises? What, uh, what did they make you think of? Well, I my mind, of course, went to uh, Star Wars. Right? They're so with, Star Wars. <laughs> with the Empire. <laughs> and that's who I thought of, although the f- couple of scenes we saw, I didn't think they were as either well-organized, maybe well-organized, as the uh, Empire was because they engaged in co- activity that was close to buffoonery to me. So maybe this far out on Tatooine, you don't get the best Empire soldiers. So, <laughs> they're not sending their talent out. <laughs> no, their talent's not going to the outer rim. So maybe there's something to say about that. That's the reason. But I immediately went to the Empire mm-hmm. and made those comparisons. It would seem you made the same. I did, even down to the design of the uniforms and like the design of the command room that we got to see. It's just like that could have come out of the original 1970s Star Wars. It looked just like it. I loved it. The thing that struck me about the command room and the commander was in the Empire, if a I was not dotted, <laughs> they viewed that as an existential threat. <laughs> and they would either send an entire force to wipe out who didn't dot the I or investigate it. And I didn't see any of that sort of complete paranoia. Mm-hmm. I saw... From the Empire. Awesome. So any final thoughts on, on your first episode of Firefly? I wanted to see more. I want to get to know these characters. They've intrigued me. Obviously, from just from our discussion, there's lots of similarities to other shows we've watched, both in science fiction, even to Alfred Hitchcock at all. But I'm really enjoying the mishmash of various genres, languages, peoples, concepts and ideas so i'll be really interested to see where brother wheaton takes us fantastic then we will talk about it when we do our next episode which is going to be episode two the train job
This is Tom Vox. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. I hope you'll join Megan and I again for our next episode where we take up episode two of Firefly, The Train Job. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever great podcasts are listened to. The award-winning Because That's What Heroes Do is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.